Welcome to this week's lesson. This is the second of our four lessons about calculus. The first lesson, which was three weeks ago, I hope you remember, we talked about what a limit is and what a derivative really means. We explained that a derivative really means the slope of the graph of a function. And we saw that we could use the limit, the definition involving the limit to calculate the derivative of a function at the point. But in practice, we don't want to be using limits every time. We want some rules which we can use to calculate the derivative much easier. First chapter of this week's lesson is differentiation rules, the rules that we can use. Then we'll move on to looking at derivatives of trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, etc. And then in the final chapter of this week's lesson, we'll talk about a technique called the chain rule, which we can use to find the derivatives of more complicated functions. First, let's talk about some differentiation rules. The easiest type of function that you might think about is a constant function. k is a number, then the derivative of k is just 0. The graph of a constant function is just a horizontal line. The slope of a horizontal line is 0. So the derivative of any number k is equal to 0. x to the power n. The derivative of x to the power n formula that we have is that this is equal to n multiplied by x to the power n minus 1. A simple example, suppose we're looking at x to the power 3. Here n is equal to 3. So the formula tells us we have, must have 3 and then x to the power 3 minus 1, which of course is 3x squared. We can also use this formula for some more, um, for some slightly more difficult formula. For example, we can calculate the derivative of square root of x because another way to write the square root of x is x to the power of a half. Now we have x to the power n, where n is equal to a half. We use our formula, n, x to the power n minus 1. We get a half, x to the power minus a half, which we can then change back into square root notation. It's the same as 1 over 2 square root of x. Or we can look at the derivative of 1 divided by x to the power 4 using this form. Because another way to write 1 divided by x to the power 4 is x to the power minus 4. Now we have x to the power n again, but now n is a negative number. That doesn't matter, we can still use the formula. It's still n x to the power n minus 1. Well, so that's minus 4x to the power of minus 4 minus 1 minus 4x to the power of minus 5. Change this back into the notation that we started with. Minus 4 divided by x to the power of 5. Our third rule is the constant multiple rule. Let's suppose we have a function, let's say u of x, which is differentiable, and let's suppose we have a number, k then the derivative of k multiplied by u. k is a number, we can just take the number outside, just as we do with limits, and we find that this is k multiplied by the derivative of u. Most of these formulae I'm going to give you are not proving, but this one I do want to, to prove. The derivative of ku. The derivative means by definition, the limit as h tends to 0 of this function of x plus 1 minus this function of x divided by h. So it's the limit as h tends to u of ku, x plus h minus ku and x divided by h. By the constant multiple rule for limits, anytime we have a number inside the limit, we can take this outside of the limit. So we could write this as k multiplied by the limit as h tends to 0 of u of x plus h minus u of x divided by h. 
But of course, this limit is just the derivative of u. So we end up with just what we want. We end up with k multiplied by the derivative of u. Two simple examples using the constant not rule. First example, the number k is equal to 3. The derivative of 3x squared. 3 is a number, we can take a number outside of the derivative. And we can write it as 3 multiplied by the derivative of x squared. x to the power n, we know how to do this. The derivative of x squared must be 2x using our formula. We end up with 3 multiplied by 2x or 6x. We can also do the same thing if we have minus a function, because minus u is the same as the number of minus 1 multiplied by u. And any time we have a number, in this case minus 1, we can take the number outside of the derivative to get minus 1 multiplied by this derivative, or simplify this as just minus du dx. In other words, any time you have a number or minus sign, we just take this outside of the derivative and we'll deal with that later. The sum rule. What do we do if we have a differential function plus a differential function? Let's suppose we have two functions, u and v, and let's suppose that they are both differential at the point x0 then their sum, u plus v, is also differential at this point. And we have a formula. The formula tells us that the derivative of u plus v is the same as the derivative of u plus the derivative of v. And again, this just comes from the sum rule for limits. I'm not going to write down the proof of this rule, but you could write it down just using the, def the limit definition of derivative, split this up into two limits, and then you'll find that you get du dx plus du dx. For example, differentiate y is equal to x cubed plus 4 over 3 x squared minus 5x plus 1. What do we have? We have x to the power n, another x to the power n, another x to the power n. We also have number and minus sign we consider to be a number because minus is the same as um, minus 1. So what we can do is we can split this derivative into lots of smaller um, derivatives. We can first think about the derivative of x cubed and then we can think about the derivative of 4 over 3 x squared. In fact, 4 over 3 we could take outside and just think about the derivative of x squared. And then minus, we don't need to worry about minus inside the derivative. The derivative of 5x, again, 5 can come out if we want to, plus the derivative of a constant 1. The derivative of a constant is always equal to 0. So we don't need to worry about that. The derivative of x cubed is 3x squared. The derivative of x squared is 2x, so we get 8 over 3x. The derivative of x is 1, so we just get minus 5, and, and then plus 0 because the derivative of a constant is always 0. Next example. Does the curve y is equal to x, um, x to the power 4 minus 2x squared plus 2 have any points where the derivative is equal to 0? And if so, if the answer is yes, where are they? To answer this question, we need first to find the derivative of this function. So first we're going to want to calculate dy dx. And this is a simple polynomial. We should be able to see quite quickly that the derivative is 4x cubed minus 4x. I want to factorize this, and I'll leave it for you to check, that I can factorize this into 4x multiplied by x minus 1 multiplied by x plus 1. 
Now, the question is, are there any points where dy dx is equal to zero? In other words, are there any points where for x, x minus 1, x plus 1 is equal to 0? And the answer is yes. There's an x just here. If x is equal to 0, then the whole thing is 0. How can we make x minus 1 equal to 0? We could choose x equal to 1. And the final bracket. How could we make x plus 1 be equal to 0? We could choose x is equal to minus 1. We can see that the derivative is equal to 0 if and only if x is minus 1 or 0 or 1. I can show you a graph of this function. This is the function in question. We can see that the derivative is equal to 0 if x is minus 1. We can see that the derivative is equal to 0 if x is equal to 0. And we can see that the derivative is equal to 0 if x is equal to 1. The product rule. What do we do if we have two functions multiplied together? Let's suppose u and v are both differentiable at a particular point, x0 then their product is also differentiable at this point, and we have a formula for the derivative of u multiplied by v. The formula that you will need to remember is u multiplied by dv dx plus v multiplied by du dx. This is perhaps easier to remember if we use prime notation. If we use prime notation, we could write this as the derivative of uv is u prime, that's the derivative of u, multiplied by v, plus u multiplied by v prime. And you will notice that it doesn't matter which one we do first, it doesn't matter if we differentiate u first and then v second, or if we differentiate v in the first term and v in the second. It doesn't matter as long as we differentiate in each function once and we're doing them separately. For example, differentiate y is equal to x squared plus 1 multiplied by x cubed plus 3. We have a product of two functions. We have y is equal to u multiplied by v, where u is x squared plus 1 and v is x cubed plus 3. So we could use the product rule if we wanted to. First, we could differentiate u and then leave v as it is. And then we could leave u as it is and differentiate v. And if we go through this calculation, and I'm going to leave this for you to check, we find that the answer is 5x to the power 4 plus 3x squared plus 6x. There's another way to answer this question. Instead of using the product rule, we could multiply the brackets out, and then we could differentiate each term. If we use this method, we get the same answer. 5x to the power 4 plus 3x squared plus 6x plus 3. I leave it for you to choose whichever method you wish to use if you have a question like this. Sometimes one method is easier, sometimes the other method is easier. I leave it for you to choose. What do we do if we have u divided by v? Let's suppose we have two differentiable functions. Let's suppose a differential at the point x0. And there's one extra thing we need to worry about. We need to make sure that v is not equal to 0 at this point, because we can't divide by 0. Then u divided by v is also differential at this point, And we have a formula. The derivative of u divided by v is u prime v minus u v prime divided by v squared. Let me just remind you of the product rule. The derivative of u v was u, also had a u prime and a v, and a u v prime. But the product rule had a plus in it.
conversion rule needs a minus sign in the middle and it needs to be divided by v squared. Let's use the quotient rule to calculate a derivative. Differentiate t squared minus 1 divided by t cubed plus 1. We have a function divided by a function, so it makes sense to use the quotient rule. I'm going to start with the formula. Start by writing dy dt is equal to u prime v minus u v prime divided by v squared. Here, u is the function on top, that's t squared minus 1, and v is the function on the bottom, t cubed plus 1. Let's stick these in. Stick in u and v, v squared on the bottom, and etc. I calculate the derivatives. The derivative of t squared minus 1 is just 2t. The derivative of t cubed plus 1 is just 3t squared. Multiply this all out and simplify. And I'll leave it for you to check that the answer is minus t to the power 4 plus 3t squared plus 2t divided by t cubed plus 1 squared. Another example. Another example of a function divided by a function. Differentiate the square root of s minus 1 divided by the square root of s plus 1. Again, we have function divided by function. Now, the function on the top is the square root of s minus 1, and the function on the bottom is the square root of s plus 1. And I'm going to remind you of a formula from earlier are in today's lesson. Earlier today, we saw that the derivative of the square root of s is 1 divided by 2 square root of s. So what do we do? I'm going to start by writing down the formula, and then I'm going to put in u and v. I'm going to calculate the derivatives, and I'm going to simplify. I have u prime multiplied by v minus u v prime divided by v squared. The derivative of u, that's the derivative of the square root of s, minus the derivative of 1. The derivative of 1, of course, is just 0 because it's a constant, so we just get 1 over 2 square root of s. For the same reason, the derivative of v is also just 1 over 2 square root of s. When we simplify this, and I'll leave this for you to check, we get 1 divided by the square root of s, square root of s plus 1, or squared. Second order derivatives. If we have a differential function f, then we can differentiate it to get f prime of x. This is also a function. What, do we, what can we do if this function is not just any old function, but it's a differential function? Then we can differentiate it a second time to get a new function, a third function, which we call f double prime. f double prime is called the second derivative of f. And there's different ways to write the second derivative. I could write f double prime of x. If y is equal to f of x, that's the same as y double prime. This is the derivative of f prime, so we could write as d dx of f prime x, or d dx of dy dx, or d squared y dx squared, or dy prime dx. Many ways to write this. For example, let's suppose y is equal to x to the power 6. Then the first derivative, y prime, must be 6x to the power 5. And this is a differential function. We can differentiate this again. We can write that y double prime is the derivative of y prime. That's the derivative of 6x to the power 5, or 30x to the power 4. Or, there's another way to write this. 
true derivatives of x to the power 6 is the derivative of the derivative of x to the power 6, the derivative of 6x to the power 5, or 30x to the power 4. We can go higher. If f double prime is differentiable, then we can differentiate it. And this derivative f triple prime is called third derivative f. And so on. If f triple prime is differentiable, then its derivative is the fourth derivative f. If the fourth derivative of f is differentiable, then its derivative is called the fifth derivative f, and so on. The n minus one derivative of f is differentiable, the derivative of the nth derivative of f, and so on. We can go on and on as far as we want. Before I go on, the first three derivatives is common to use primalization, f double prime, f triple prime, and so on. But after three, we usually change notation to a number in brackets. And that's because if I wrote f prime 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 prime, then that's just silly. It makes more sense to write thirteenth derivative of f. For example, find the first four derivatives of x to the power of 3 minus 3x squared plus 2. First derivative, we have to do this, 3x squared minus 6x. And then we can differentiate again. The derivative of y prime is y double prime, 6x minus 6. So we can differentiate this. The derivative of 6x minus 6 is 6. The derivative of 6 is 0. That answers the question. These are the first four derivatives of our function. Note that because the derivative of 0 is always 0, we can go on further. The fifth derivative is 0. The sixth derivative is 0. The seventh derivative is 0. The eighth derivative, and so on. In fact, all of the derivatives after 4 are all equal to 0. The trigonometric functions, sine, cosine, etc. Two formulae to remember. The derivative of sine is cos, the derivative of cos is minus sine. For example, Differentiate y is equal to x squared minus sine x. First, product rule and constant multiple rule to separate this into two easy derivatives. The derivative of x squared is 2x, and the derivative of sine x is cos x. So the answer is just 2x minus cos x. Differentiate x squared multiplied by sine x. This is a product rule question because we have a function multiplied by a function. We're going to use the formula u prime v plus u v prime. So first I'm going to be differentiating x squared, leaving sine x as it is, and then plus, leaves x squared just as it is, and differentiate sine x to get 2x sine x plus x squared cos x. Differentiate sine x divided by x. This is a quotient rule question because we have a function divided by a function. So this time I'm going to use the formula u prime v minus u v prime divided by u v squared. So first I'm differentiating sine x and then multiplying by x minus leave sine x as it is and differentiate x and then divide by x squared. I'll leave it for you to check that after we calculate these derivatives and rearrange a little bit, 
we get x cos x minus sine x divided by x squared. And I'm choosing to write x first and then cos second, just so there's no confusion. If I wrote cos x multiplied by x, then there's a little bit of confusion. Is it cos x first and then multiplied by x, or is it cos x multiplied by x? So just to make it easier to understand, I choose to write the x first. Differentiate 5x plus cos x. The derivative of cos x is minus size x, so this is 5 minus size x. Differentiate sine x cos x. We have a function multiplied by a function. This means sine x multiplied by cos x. We should imagine there are brackets like this, but it's convention that we don't write them. I'm going to use the product rule. First, I'm differentiating sine x and leaving cos x just as is. Then I'm going to leave sine x the way it is and differentiate cos x. I get cos squared x minus sine squared x. Cos squared x means cos x all squared. Differentiate cos x divided by 1 minus sine x. We're going to need to use the quotient rule because we have a function divided by a function. Using the quotient rule, derivative of the function on the top and then multiplied by the function on the bottom minus the function on the top multiplied by the derivative of the function on the bottom and then divide by the function on the bottom square. The derivative of cos x is minus sine x, and the derivative of 1 minus sine x is 0 minus cos x. So we get minus sine x plus sine squared x plus cos squared x. This is something I hope you recognize from high school. Sine squared plus cos squared, of course, is equal to 1. So we get... 1 minus sine x divided by 1 minus sine x squared. We can simplify this a little bit because we have 1 minus sine x on the top and on the bottom. Cancel these and we end up with this 1 divided by 1 minus sine x. And this is the type of answer I would expect from you. The tangent function, the derivative of tan is equal to sec squared. Sec, you will call, means 1 divided by cos. I'm going to prove this. And I'm going to prove this using the quotient rule. Using the quotient rule, because tan means sine divided by cos, we have the derivative of sine multiplied by cos minus sine multiplied by the derivative of cos divided by cos squared. That's cos cos minus sine minus sine. Minus minus becomes plus, and you have cos squared plus sine squared. As I just said, said cos squared plus sine squared is 1. So that's 1 divided by cos squared x, or sec squared x. The other three formulae that we, you may need the derivative of sec is sec x tan x. The derivative of cotan x is minus cosec squared x. And the derivative of cosec x is minus cosec x cotan x. It's possible to use the quotient rule to prove all three of these rules. Sometimes I ask you to do one of these in an exam. Sometimes I don't. I haven't decided yet if this, year, this year's final exam will ask you to prove one of these. So just in case I do ask that, I advise you to practice them beforehand. Find y double prime 
if y is equal to sec x. In other words, find the second derivative of sec x. We know the first derivative, because it was on the previous slide, the first derivative is sec x 10x. We need to differentiate this a second time. We need to calculate the derivative of sec x 10x. So this is a product rule question. That's the derivative of sec x multiplied by 10x plus sec x multiplied by the derivative of 10x. The derivative of sec is sec x 10x. We just said that. The derivative of tan is sec squared. Simplify it a bit, we end up with sec x tan squared x plus sec cubed x. And our final chapter of today's lesson is about the chain rule. How do we differentiate functions like sine of x squared minus 4? We have a function of a function. To differentiate functions like this, we have a rule called the chain rule. First of all, the condition for hypotheses. Suppose that f is differentiable at the point u equal to g of x, and let's suppose that g of x is differential at x. Then f composed g is differential at x, and we have a formula. The derivative of f composed of g is f prime of g of x multiplied by g prime of x. I think this rule is easier to remember if we use Leibniz's notation. If we use Leibniz notation, the chain rule says dy dx is equal to dy du multiplied by dy dx. And I think this is easier to remember because if we pretend that this means dy divided by du and du divided by dx, we can imagine that the du's cancel out and we end up with just dy dx. So, differentiate sine of x cubed minus 4. We can think of this as y is equal to sine of u, where u is the function x squared minus 4. We know how to differentiate each of these two easier functions. Then we just need to use the chain rule to combine them. The chain rule says dy dx is equal to dy du du dx. dy du is cos u, and du dx is 2x. So we have 2x multiplied by cos u. But we're not finished yet. Our final answer shouldn't include u. So we need to substitute in for u and write down the final answer, 2x cos of x squared minus 4. One more thing to write, one more thing to say before I continue. In mathematics, if we use a rule, we should say which rule we're using. In this question, I've used the chain rule, so it's important to write by the chain rule. And in the final exam, there will be points for saying which rule you're using. If you use the chain rule, write by the chain rule somewhere in your answer. Differentiate sine of x squared plus x. The first thing to do is to choose a u. We look at sine of x squared plus x, and we choose our u. For this problem, it makes sense to choose that u is equal to x squared plus x. Then we use the chain rule. The derivative of sine of x squared plus x is the same as d du of sine u multiplied by du dx. Then we imagine the du's cancel out and we ended up with d dx of sine u. The derivative of sine u with respect to u is just cos u. And the derivative of x squared plus x with respect to x is 2x plus 1. 
So that's 2x plus 1, because final answer should not include u, so we replace u by x squared plus x. And again, I've used the chain rule, so I finish my answer by writing by the chain rule. Differentiate tan of 5 minus sine 2t. Look at this function. Tan of 5 minus sine 2t. We need to choose u. It makes sense to me that we choose u is equal to 5 minus sine 2t. Because then our function is just tan of u. We don't have to differentiate tan of u, it's just 6 squared u. We use the chain rule. The chain rule says dg dt is equal to dg du du dt. dg du is just 6 squared u. du dt is the derivative of 5 minus sine 2t. Before we can calculate this, this derivative, we need to use the chain rule a second time. We need to choose a new letter. We've already used u. You can choose any letter you that you want. I choose to use w. And I choose to let w be equal to 2t, because then I have 5 minus sine of w. OK, going back to the calculation. By the chain rule, instead of doing d dt of this function, I'm doing d dw of this function, and then multiplying by dw dt. The derivative of 5 minus sine w with respect to w is minus cos w, and dw dt is just 2. So we have. 6 squared u minus cos w multiplied by 2. Final answer should not include either u or w. We need to replace them by functions of t. Final answer, once we've substituted in and rearranged a little bit, is minus 2 cos 2t, two 6 squared 5 minus sine 2t. And just to repeat what I've been saying, the final answer should not have u or w in it. The final answer should only be a function of t. We can also use the chain rule to calculate powers of a function. Let's suppose f is a differential function of u, and let's suppose u is a differential function of x. Let's suppose y is equal to f of u. Then the chain rule, dy dx equal to dy du, du dx, is the same as saying the derivative of f of u is equal to f prime of u multiplied by du dx. Now let's suppose we're not interested in any type of function, let's suppose we're only, now we're only interested in power functions. Let's suppose for the time being that f of u is always equal to u to the power n. Then we know the derivative of, of this function is always n u to the power n minus 1. So instead of the formula in the red circle, we have the formula at the bottom. The ddx of u to the power n is the derivative of u to the power n, that's n u to the power n minus 1, multiplied by du dx. In the next few slides, we're going to be using this formula. For example, calculate the derivative of 5x cubed minus x to the power 4, all to the power 7. If we call this u, 
then we're differentiating u to the power of 7. And we know the derivative of u to the power of 7 is 7 u to the power of 6. So we get 7, 5x cubed minus x to the power of 4, to the power of 6, and then by the chain rule, so multiplied by the derivative of 5x cubed minus x to the power of 4, or multiplied by 15x squared minus 4x cubed. Now, you will notice that in this answer I didn't write by the chain rule. If I'd given this answer in the exam, then I wouldn't receive full marks because I didn't say which rule I was using. Another example, again, I forgot to write by the train rule, so I won't get full marks in another example. The derivative of 1 over 3x minus 2, of course, that's the same as the derivative of 3x minus 2 to the power of minus 1. By the chain rule, by the power formula version of the chain rule, that's minus 1, 3x minus 2 to the power of minus 2, multiplied by the derivative of 3x minus 2. And we can simplify this and rearrange. We have minus 3 divided by 3x minus 2 all squared. Or we can solve this problem using the quotient rule because we have a function 1 divided by a function 3x minus 2. I'll leave it for you to check that if you use the quotient rule, you get the same answer. The derivative of sine to the power of 5 of x. We have u equal to sine x, and we're calculating the derivative of u to the power of 5. So, of course, we get 5u to the power of 4, or 5 sine to the power of 4 of x, and then multiplied by the derivative of sine x, the answer is 5 sine to the power of 4 x cos x. Here's another one. Differentiate the absolute value of x. And I'm saying absolute value of x is equal to the square root of x squared. Let's think about this. If, I, if x is, say, 3, then x cubed, of course, x, sorry, x squared, of course, is 9, and the square root of x squared, or square root of 9, is 3, which is the same as the absolute value of 3. What about if x is minus 3? And again, x squared is 9. And then the square root of x squared, the square root of 9, is 3, which is the same as the absolute value of minus 3. So hopefully that persuades you that this is true. The absolute value of x is the square root of x squared. In this calculation, I'm going to be assuming that x is not equal. Now, what I'm doing is I'm differentiating the square root of x squared. So that's d du of the square root of u multiplied by d dx of x squared by the chain rule. We know how to differentiate the square root of u. We've seen earlier that's the same as 1 divided by 2 square root of u. And, of course, the derivative of x squared is 2x. Two is cancel, and we end up with x divided by square root of x squared, or x divided by the absolute value of x. Let me draw a graph of the absolute value of x. Here it is. Let's try, let me try again.
if x is a positive number, then x is the same as the square root of x, so we get the same number divided by the same number. Over here, the slope is the absolute value of x. So the slope is x divided by the absolute value of x, which is equal to 1. Over on the left, Again, the slope is, the, is x divided by the absolute value of x. If x is a negative number, the absolute value of x is minus the number. So we end up with the number divided by minus the number, or minus 1. And of course, this is not true at 0. The whole calculation doesn't work if we're at 0. Let y be 1 divided by 1 minus 2x cubed, as long as x is not a half, because we don't want to be divided by 0. Show that dy dx is always a positive number. Hmm. First thing to do would be to calculate the derivative of this function and see what we have. I want dy dx. That's the derivative of 1 minus 2x and power minus 3. Go through the calculation, and I'll leave it for you to check that we get 6 divided by 1 minus 2x to the power of 4. And I'll remind you that we're doing this as long as x is not a half. Now, what do we have? On the tops, we have 6. That's a positive number. On the bottom, we have 1 minus 2x to the power of 4. Anything to the power of 4, any non-zero number to the power of 4, is always a positive number. So we have a positive number divided by a positive number, but that's a positive number. This shows that the derivative is always positive, as long as x is not a half. One final idea for this week's lesson. Why do we use radians in calculus? In high school, we learned about angles using degrees. Wouldn't it be easier to use degrees in calculus? The answer, so as I said earlier, is degrees don't work in calculus. We need to use radians. Why is that true? The answer is. The formula, the nice formula which, which we, we saw in the previous section of the derivative of sine is equal to cos, is only true if we use radians. What happens if instead of using radians we want to use degrees? Now that we have the chain rule, we can answer this. Before I go on, let me just remind you. Here's a picture of half a circle. The angle inside half a circle is 180 degrees. If the radius of the circle is 1, then the distance around the outside of this half circle is the same as the angle in the radius. That means that 180 degrees is the same as pi radians. Or I could write this as 180 degrees is equal to pi. When we use radians, we don't have to use any symbols. When we use degrees, we need to use this little circle to say that we're using degrees. That means 1 degree is pi divided by 180 radians. Multiply both sides by x. x degrees is equal to pi x divided by 180. So, Now we can differentiate sine of x degrees. This is the same as the derivative of sine of pi x divided by 180. Using the chain rule, I'll leave it for you to check, pi divided by 180 cos pi x over 180, or pi divided by 180 cos x degrees. If we use radians, we have a nice formula, derivative of cos. 
If we insist on using degrees, we have this formula, which is not as nice. The derivative of sine x degrees is equal to pi divided by 180 cos x degrees. So yes, we could actually use degrees if we really wanted to, but it becomes messy. We have lots of extra numbers that we need to keep track of. This is why we say that we use gradients in calculus. And this is the end of this week's lesson. Next week will be the third of our four lessons about calculus. We'll talk about antiderivatives and we'll start talking about integration, which we could think about as an inverse of differentiation. Are there any questions? Let me just check. At the moment, it's set for the 17th of June. But this, this may change. After it's finalized, I'll make announcements through the OLAN system. That's a Thursday morning at 9 a.m.